Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We are once again live streaming from the Boathouse at Confluence Park, uh, hopefully for not much longer. Uh, I'm Doug Buchanan, I'm a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Columbus Business First. Uh, we really thank you for joining us today. Metro Club live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch, PNC, and also streaming today, NBC4i. We'd also like to thank those of you who purchased a virtual seat for today's forum. We're very grateful for your support, and largely because of you, we are able to continue live streaming. You can learn more about CMC, register for events, join or renew your memberships, purchase a virtual seat, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Today's forum is sponsored by Starry, and I'd like to welcome Virginia Lamb Abrams, Abrams, I'm sorry, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Strategic Advancement to introduce our speakers. Virginia. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Columbus Metropolitan Club. Starry is proud to support CMC and its mission to inform and engage the community through these weekly and vital public conversations. Pre-pandemic, the digital divide was an issue that was largely framed as a rural problem. It was pretty clear. If you didn't have broadband access, it was because none existed. What the pandemic has brought into clear focus is the fact that digital gaps are not just a rural issue, but one that also plagues our cities. But the urban digital gap is different. In our cities, it's not an issue of access. It's all about affordability, or more precisely, the lack of it. I'm really excited to introduce today's panel because Starry, the company I work for, will soon be putting down roots in Columbus, bringing a new, affordable, high-quality broadband option to residents across Metro Columbus. We know the cost of not having connectivity is high, especially now. You can't work, you can't learn, and more and more, you can't do everyday things like pay your bills without a reliable home internet connection. Our mission at Starry is to connect as many people as possible to affordable, high-quality broadband, because we believe if we can do that, our society and our communities will be better off. There's an old saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, in today's modern economy, that tide is internet access. We need to bring broadband choice and competition to all communities to drive affordability, increase service quality, and ultimately close the digital gap in a lasting and permanent way. Today's conversation will focus on the policies and strategies that will make ubiquitous, affordable broadband a reality for everyone across Metro Columbus, because that should be our ambition. There has never been a more important or timely topic to discuss in this setting, and that makes me even more excited to hear the discussion today from our esteemed panel. So please welcome Autumn Glover, President of PAC and OSU Wexner Medical Center, Matt McClellan of the Ohio Development Services Agency, and Dr. Talisa Dixon, the Superintendent of our Columbus City Schools. And now to introduce our host and moderator, NBC4's very own Carrie Charles. Carrie, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, so much. I'm going to get settled in here. And I have to say, I was with uh, CMC last in September, and I hadn't heard from anyone since. And I was thinking, geez, I must have blew it. <laughs> but then I got an email, so I'm back. So thanks for having me uh, again to talk about uh, and help lead a conversation about something that's so important in our community. And then within our community, we have so many different communities. and. Every time I go to an event, I always think about the purpose and how I fit in into the conversation. Um, I kind of felt like a pastor this morning because I was rushing around, uh, getting ready. I stayed in the bed for an extra 30 minutes. I call it an extra 30 minute lay. And uh, I was all ready. I had been prepared. I knew the time I needed to be here. I knew um, that the construction is taking place just west of here, which caused me to be a little late last time. And so uh, I, was, I had been prepared, but on my own part, I wasn't ready to get here at 11.30. I got here at 11.37, but that's okay. 
And I say that because I think about being prepared versus being ready, and I can hear my parents telling me, we prepared you. You have to do the work to get ready. And I think that's what uh, goes into this conversation when we talk about uh, digital divide. And uh, I think about the students first, because so many of them may not be prepared, so they can't be ready. So I uh, hope that makes sense. I hope my dad is proud, because he's like, oh, that boy paid attention. Uh, so I, I want to begin with just each of you, as we talk about the digital divide, what does that mean to you? And how do you fit into this conversation, you being your organization? Autumn. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and I, that, that resonated. So amen, Pastor. <laughs> um, so I will say, you know, obviously the digital divide has been studied for decades. Um, and this pandemic uh, really elevated and amplified a lot of inequities. I think our society is discussing many of them and the digital divide being one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll say for my organization, PACT, um, we're a 10-year-old nonprofit focused on one neighborhood. So we get to wake up every day and think about how we make one community better with the community. So I like to say our secret sauce is our expertise is around civic engagement. So last March, um, as the pandemic started, we were actually working on a partnership with Jewish Family Services to host a series of workforce development events. And the pandemic um, became very apparently a disruptor to that work. And so we, we went through a number of scenarios. What if we had a socially distanced workforce event? What if we had a virtual event? And I'll tell you, Long story short, we were not able to complete those events and we were halted dead in our tracks in a way that we hadn't been before. We really know our place, we know our people, we had identified a need and a partner to address it, but we could not make a connection. And I really felt like we were trying to part the Red Sea. We were really trying to get people who were underemployed and unemployed connected to jobs and employers who wanted them, but we couldn't connect to them quite literally. And so we took a pause and we said, how were we so woefully unprepared um, for this moment, right? What about our organization and our community has left, of it, left us in this moment that we didn't know how to respond? So, um, you know, PACT is a part of a national network of community development organizations that are focused on place-based transformations. And so I immediately picked up the phone and called my friends across the country and said, how are you keeping in touch? How are you continuing to serve? Um, over and over, I think all of us were community-based organizations, both locally and nationally, faced with this problem that we had a population, primarily low-income folks, that we were serving that were used to standing in line. And the notion of getting online was just a barrier they couldn't get across. Yeah. And so our, our our um, initiative really launched in this moment of trying to get people connected to workforce, but quickly recognizing that the internet is a platform for life. <clears throat> Excuse me, as Virginia mentioned earlier, people use the internet for school, um, for work, for telehealth, and even for social benefit. And so we leaned into our network nationally to learn, um, but then locally a coalition formed that I hope I'll have an opportunity to talk about um, here shortly, but I will say, our organization leaned into that secret sauce. We needed to go talk to the people and figure out how we could help. And, and we really start all of our work with how can I help? So um, definitely looking forward to the discussion and, and sharing more about that work. Sure thing, Matt. Good afternoon. Um, you know, at the state level, uh, Governor DeWine, Lieutenant Governor Houston, when they came into office, they recognized that broadband was an issue. Uh, they set up Broadband Ohio, which is housed at the Development Services Agency, where I work. And we quickly kind of saw, you know, there's two, we're, we're trying to focus on access. And when we think about access at the state level, we think about the availability of internet, uh, the infrastructure actually being able to connect, but also the affordability of internet. Um, and so we're, we're working with our partners in the legislature right now. We've actually uh, announced just over $300 million worth of funding uh, that we want to put towards infrastructure as well as affordability efforts. Uh, those, those efforts are progressing. Uh, our director was actually talking about that earlier this week. Uh, but we also know that it's not just about the affordability or the, uh, uh, the availability. We also have to think about how we, you know, do, do those we're trying to reach have the devices or the technology to get connected? 
Uh, we've partnered with organizations like PCs for People uh, at the state level to donate some equipment. Uh, and we're also thinking about it in terms of digital literacy. You know, do people, if they have the devices, if they have the connection, if they can afford it, do they know how to use the technology? Uh, we're working with the Library Council to try to develop some of those. Uh, and I think central to all of our efforts uh, is really it's collaboration. You know, the state doesn't have all the answers. The state can't solve this on our own. But if we partner with other organizations, like PACT with our schools, we can get there. And so we are all about bringing different entities together to educate us, inform us, tell us you know, where, all the ch where are the challenges and how can the state be a partner in that. Dr. Dixon. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, for us, it was a, a shock to our system. And I say that because when um, the governor closed schools, we immediately had to figure out how we were going to continue learning at home. So we immediately started giving 20,000 computers out to our families. So we set up um, di different uh, places throughout the district and told the families to come pick up their devices. Um, but we soon learned that it was a, uh-oh, people were calling the schools and said, we can't log in, we can't log on. And we were thinking, well, what's happening, right? You know, is it an infrastructure issue? You know, here we're in the largest city, we're in a capital city, we have to have broadband internet. Is that the, the issue? Um, and then we soon learned that families needed hotspots. So we start partnering with organizations and to date we were able to get 4,000 hotspots to families. And then we had families say, well, you know, you only gave us one device. Mm -hmm. We have multiple kids in our household, so we need more than one device. And then for those families, we saw that they did not have fast internet speed. So that was an issue. So we had to start giving more hotspots to families. So for us, we didn't expect to still be um, in, this, in this learning continuum. So we, we don't have all of our students back. We do have 24,000 students that are back um, as of February 1st. And we have our sixth graders and our high school students who start next week. Um, but it's so, it was so important that if our students gonna remain remote, they have to be able to access um, all the learning platforms um, that our teachers were providing, the district was providing. And if not, then our students are going to face a deficit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not because of our own volition, but because we wanted to make sure that our students can continue to learn and feel that um, there was no barrier to that learning. So that was an eye opener for us to make sure that our students had a device, they had internet, and that for whatever reason that our families could not afford it, that we would partner with organizations and we would be sitting at the table to help our students get through that. And I also wanna make sure that we have a lot of students, about 6,000 of our students are considered vulnerable youth. So they either are in the foster care systems or they live in homeless shelters. So they have to be able to have the opportunity to continue their learning too. And so this thing of having um, access and affordability cannot be a barrier for our students. So we have to find a way to work together, to partner with organizations organizations to figure out how we're going to help families. This is one thing that we've learned through this pandemic that together, you know, it goes back to we cannot focus on Bloom's taxonomy and making sure that kids are necessarily, um, uh, you know, you know that, that they're reading and writing, but it's more important that we focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do our students have their basic needs? Do their families have what they need so that our students can continue to learn? And so we welcome the opportunity to be at the table to figure out how how we can help our families, because if we help our families, our students would be more successful. Oh, y'all got a lot of work to do. <laughs> or should I say we have a lot of work to do? Because I mean, it really, it really, like you said, it takes a village. Yes. Uh, and then there's, there are parts that we all have to do, uh, even being just advocates uh, and getting the word out. Dr. Dixon, you spoke about the um, challenges you all faced in realizing that we have to get the, this um, access to students. We have to get devices in their hands. You talked about the vulnerable students. There are also students who, without the pandemic, they were already facing so many challenges. Yeah. 
how do you catch up on that lost education as far as, and, and I'm asking this because I want you to talk about the effects of the digital divide. Yeah, so, very good question. So there were some learnings that we've, we've um, that we've discovered, um, and one that some students are doing well on, the, on this platform, right? Um, some students that were not connected in a school building are now connected on this platform. And that's not a bad thing. So we have learned that some students, you can still engage um, on a digital platform. Um, but we've also seen that some of our students are having some social and emotional um, um, concerns because they're not connected with their peers. And so that was the sense of urgency we had to at least get our babies in. So our youngest learners are back, even if it's just two days a week, they're back and they're having that personal personal attention with their teachers and their peers. Um, we know that some of our students, you know, that in-person learning is the best uh, model of learning, and we know that our students uh, have experienced some loss, and so we have a summer program that um, we've already launched. We, the first day we launched our application last Monday, we had 600 people signed up. Mm. So we are planning a summer program for 10, at least 10,000 students students, and that would not only be some remediation, but there would also be acceleration, because all of our students did not lose doing this. They have, some of our students have really done well, and we want to make sure that their learning is accelerated. And we also want to make sure they experience Columbus, you know, so we want to be able to take our students to um, connect their learning to the museums and to the zoos and to all of these places that they have access. They live in a capital city, they have access to so many things that in taking that learning experience with the curriculum that we believe that we can do a heavy lift starting um, this summer. And we're doing a lot right now with our students being in the classroom. Our teachers have been stating that our students are proving to them that they have been learning while at home. So they have said our students have been working harder uh, once they're in their class, and our parents are saying the kids are working harder at home because they look forward to the two days that they're in school with their teachers and their peers. So yes, we have a lot of work to do, but we've learned so much from this um, time that we're going to accelerate the opportunities for our students using technology as a lever. Wow. I, I, I'm thinking about a young Carrie who attended Columbus City Schools, who always got the interim note home. Mr. and Mrs. Charles, Carrie's a great student, he just talks too much. But being in class and thinking, Jesus, this class going, going to end, and then sitting in front of a computer going, when do I get to go back to school? It, it, you all have so much going on. I'm just... I, I would add to that too, Carrie, <laughs> that, you know, Dr. Dixon and, and the principals and administrators and teachers, everybody who's doing their part, um, I think one of the other beautiful uh, consequences of this moment is that it really allowed our community to step up in a way mm -hmm. that they haven't before. And so certainly you all have heard about learning extension centers in our communities. And I can say in the PAC neighborhood, one, we enjoy a pretty long relationship with the school district. We mm -hmm. have a partnership called the Health Sciences Academies focused on the East High School feeder pattern. Um, but in this moment, when we were thinking about how we would step up and support as a community, um, um, I was pleasantly surprised that we had real estate developers, our churches, and other community leaders say, how can we help? Mm -hmm. um, and so these learning extension centers, I think, are filling a gap in this moment, but I, my mind is always turning with, now our churches, so hopefully none of our pastors are watching this and saying, Autumn's always giving us more assignments, but <laughs> our churches have built this capacity and our community places have increased their capacity to serve our youth, and so um, it's just been very beautiful to watch that it's not all on the district, that yeah, many yeah. people have stepped up and supported um, in this way, and it really elevates the role that schools play. That, you know, to her point, it's yeah. more than where they go to school, yeah. but it's yeah. where they have social um, supports. And, you know, I've talked with young people over the last year, and they missed that security guard who said, hey, knucklehead. And yeah. so, you know, we enjoyed the moments, um, the bright spots of this moment. And I think one of the things here 
here in Central Ohio that we all should be really proud about is that everybody stepped up and really, I think, did their part in a major yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think you make a great point on the thread that runs beneath each organization because I'm thinking about the devices going home right. uh, to the parents and grandparents who can't find the power button. Uh, don't know how to access the internet, and now they're, they are supposed to, you know, help teach uh, these young folks. But then, Matt, I'm thinking about all of the, the those same parents and or grandparents who are, you know, simply trying to log on to register to get a vaccination, uh, uh, the shot. Or they still have to go to work. Here. Yeah, they still have to go to work. So. Um, but that, <laughs> but that, that divide there, when you talked about the um, affordability, uh, I mean, that plays a huge role in this. Absolutely, <clears throat> and I. I think we're trying to tackle it on different levels. You know, certainly affordability is issue, but the investment that we make in infrastructure will also impact affordability because mm -hmm. it helps to reduce those costs. Um, of that roughly $300 million that the state has, uh, that the administration has proposed, up to 50 of that will go specifically to affordability efforts and working with providers, working with local organizations, because I think, uh, you know, as, as both my colleagues up here are talking, what's helpful for for us is they have practical application of things and yeah. we can learn from those experiences because we are not uh, prescribing a specific uh, technology or solution uh, we want to be a partner to help uh, expand that build it up uh, you spoke Carrie about the just the ability to use this technology once they have it uh, and the understanding and I mentioned earlier we're partnering with the Ohio Library Council uh, to try to develop some of those digital literacy efforts so we can not only get people connected make it affordable but also help them understand how to use the technology um, that I think a lot of us uh, that have used it regularly we take for granted uh, and it can be a, a tremendous uh, game changer for folks. Dr. Dixon, I, I saw you wanted to hop in here. I just want to read something uh, quickly. Uh, this is from a news release about partnering organizations launch community coalition to address broadband challenges in central Ohio. This went out yesterday uh, from the Columbus Metropolitan Library. And there is a point in here reference from uh, the library CEO. He says, because of the pandemic, there is a deeper understanding of the inequity or lack of access for many, as well as a real momentum for bringing broadband to all residences, similar to the rural electrification program of the 1930s. Yeah. When I heard that, I thought, what? Like, yeah. this is that mm -hmm. yeah. true comparison. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I want to touch on um, one other point. The, the power of the partnerships, I think, has just been just elevated, right? You know, I think school districts have worked in silos. <laughs> um, and we think that, and, and we, for some reason, we thought we can do it all by ourselves because we were held to do it all by ourselves, mm. expected. And we had to reach out to others. So when we talk about the learning extension centers, we have them all over um, the Columbus communities because families needed a safe place where their students could go and work, they take their device, they have internet access, and they can continue learning. So we are just so happy um, that our partners have leaned in and said, here is a way that we can help our students and our families. And that's something that we have to continue. We have to, in this community, say that we have a problem and we cannot lo no longer stay in our silos, but we come together to help our students and our families. I have 50,000 students that I want to be productive citizens in this city. They have an opportunity to make an impact on the city, the state, and the world together us working together to resolve this problem and others that will come, I think is going to help us tremendously. So when we're thinking about this, um, this how do we leverage this, this device here, right? So our teachers now are learning that it's not getting on the chalkboard in writing. You can leverage this technology. Our students are on iPads, computers. They know all of this stuff, right? So they need our teachers to become facilitators of their learning, mm -hmm. right? And so so we are working to make sure that our teachers have a professional development, they have the devices they need, the students and our families, but we're always going to have a problems if families cannot afford um, to make sure that when their students come home, 
that the learning can continue because it all can happen during the school day, right? And we need our t families, our parents to help our students, but we have to resolve this issue or learning is only going to go from eight to four and nothing happens afterwards unless you go to the library of other uh, places where you have access and, and, and the learning can continue. I, I bet there is something going on where there's the idea of the teacher being the leader, but also in the classroom, also having to be the follower for and learn from the students for those Absolutely. who aren't connected with the with the technology. Absolutely. Uh, Autumn, talk about the the disconnect that you saw when it um, came to the pandemic and getting people job ready. So um, I'll say that, you know, and to the point that you referenced about the Digital Equity Coalition, um, you know, the internet prior to the pandemic, for those of us who had the privilege of being able to subscribe to service, was really treated like a luxury. And it's not, it's an essential service at this point. And some people would go as far as to say it's a utility, it's the fourth utility. Um, but the fact of the matter is people need it for life and people deserve the dignity of being able to access it. And so um, I mentioned earlier that at the beginning of it, you know, I just had this moment and frankly, as a leader, I thought, I've been working in this neighborhood for 10 years. How did I miss this? Um, and so, you know, there's data available. The FCC has data about different census tracts and neighborhoods. Um, our census, uh, American Community Survey data is available. But prior to this moment, that data was a yes or no question. Do you have access to the internet in your home? And what I know, because I know my community very well, um, and I think that's important to note, that community-based organizations are gonna be a linchpin to this work, which is why this coalition is so powerful. But what I knew was that that data wasn't right. And so we hired people in the community, gave them PPE, and we sent them out into the community to go door to door and to interview our community. Do you have access? What kind of access? Do you know about affordable plans? There are internet service providers throughout Columbus and Franklin County. Yes, so we have access, check. But to uh, my colleague's point, is it affordable? Right. And importantly, is it effective for what they need to use it for? And what we learned was that if our residents did not have the internet, the number one reason why they didn't have the internet was the cost, that that was a luxury that they could not afford. Um, I think in the press release and certainly tons of data we can all reference, the majority of people who are disconnected are low income. Mm -hmm. And that inequity is also racial. And so, you know, the infrastructure exists, but there is a disparity there. Um, so number one reason was affordability. People couldn't afford it. The number two reason that we've heard from our community members is a fear of navigating it. That speaks to lack of digital skills. It speaks to the trust of privacy and security online. And so when we were trying to help people apply for jobs, it really started to uncover that every other part of their life, the ability to pay a bill, online, the ability to schedule an appointment or talk to a provider online, continue learning um, was going to be a disparity. But I think the most important thing is nothing is ever going to replace civic engagement. We have to talk to the people that we're trying to help, and that's what we're doing. Um, but two, affordability is a little nuanced, right? Because sometimes affordability doesn't always equal effective. And I think that's where we have a lot of work to do to make sure the internet is fast enough to connect with that teacher, connect with that learning opportunity, so. If I could jump in, you know, one of the points uh, Autumn just made was about, you know, people paying bills. And I think we all knew pre-pandemic, uh, you know, we did a lot of activity on online. I think we took a lot of that for granted. But one thing we've seen over the last year that uh, those services or those efforts that we do online have just uh, been amplified the importance of having a, a steady connection. It's not just learning for children. It's working from home for adults, those who do. It's uh, connecting uh, via telehealth uh, to visit your doctor. It's paying bills. There's a lot of, uh, of reasons you can point to that I think have just demonstrated. And I think that's what has kind of led to uh, this increased uh, coming together of organizations, the states uh, stepping in, uh, that we're, we're seeing it's more than ever, uh, it's important. And I would uh, also note that not just at the state level, there's a recognition, but even at the federal level, the most recent round of funds that uh, have been released by Congress uh, that our state got, we got roughly $560 million or so that our agency will administer for rent utility assistance. One of the utilities that are included in that is internet. Uh, 
Now, it's not to pay for gaming, uh, but for those essential functions that you need to do online. It's interesting because I, I was actually thinking, while the access is a quality of life issue, and now I'm not into gaming, but I think the world has changed so much where we focus a lot on mental health, and to not be able to take a kid to the movie theater uh, and see a movie is a huge deal now for a lot of folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're watching movies at home, but a lot of families can't do that with their kids because they don't have the access, and they can't go to the neighbor's house because there's the concern of mm -hmm. getting someone sick or bringing, bringing something home. Um, Harry, that's a great point. There's social benefit yeah. to the internet. It's Netflix. If I have the ability to watch, and I'm not going to name the shows I've been watching, but if I have the Just ability two. to watch them, watch Amend. Everybody deserves the idea of a, a movie marathon with their young people. Yeah. I think the other social benefit that we cannot discount is networking. We no longer can come to CMC on Wednesdays, but we can connect with people on social media and on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I was helping someone um, in our community looking at a job application that he filled out on his phone and he that looked good to him on his phone but what came through on my computer was a lot of jumbled letters right and it didn't come out clearly and but if he had a device that he could use yeah. and devices are expensive right um, we have been fortunate and I'm, I'm sure you're gonna ask us about some things that we've done but we've been fortunate that at the local level and I am so grateful um, for the state's investment here but at the local level, the solutions have been extremely creative, um, if I don't say so myself. But one of them is we literally in the PAC neighborhood, we're distributing 500 brand new devices. So we have PCs for people, but we also have the opportunity to leverage institutions like Ohio State that have a partnership with large providers. And so I'm able to purchase equipment at cost and give it away to people. And I think that's really important that we give people the dignity mm -hmm. to own a device, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a blessing all day long to be able to loan equipment for learning. But to your point, we want them to have a device that's theirs so yeah. that they can enjoy that as a family as well. I, I know we're focusing on urban uh, effects, but Matt, how, how, what's the comparison when we talk about the, the outlying area? Because the needs are different. Sure. I mean, we see uh, affordability and availability issues across the state. Uh, and different parts of the state require creative solutions. So a good example, the state has uh, put up and utilizing the Marx Towers system. Uh, the Marx Towers are essentially, think of giant radio towers that have been primarily used for public safety efforts. Uh, but we are now making those available that companies can install devices uh, to broadcast internet in a community, which comes in very handy when you get into those more rural areas mm -hmm. where it's much hillier. Um, and so that's, we've already had one, uh, the Riverside local schools, I think down in Southeast Ohio, we've done a, a pilot with them. We're currently in the process at the state level of accepting grant applications. So if anyone's interested, a little plug, <laughs> go check it out. Um, but it's, and I think that's speaks a little bit to the, you know, we are not trying to prescribe a specific solution. Um, we, we want to work with partners to figure that out. The, the other stat I'll, I'll note when it comes to uh, the availability of, of broadband, we know that there are roughly, I think, about 300,000 house, 300, households in the state, uh, amounting to about a million people who do not have connection to the internet. Mm. Uh, and so I think the investment that the state has outlined, we, we estimate uh, on the low end that if, if we get all, that, all of that out the door over the next two years, we could le see the connection of upwards of 73,000 households uh, in the state. Could be more than that, um, trying to be conservative there, but uh, just a little taste of kind of what we're looking at around the state. But when you hear that, Dr. Dixon, there was a reaction there. Yeah. Uh, what, what was going on, going on there? You know, I... I'm glad, mm -hmm. right? I think we have to um, think about our, our families and what they need and how we move forward. Um, our school district would never be the same again. 
right? We won't go back to chalkboards and chalk dust anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we have to utilize technology as our lever for learning. Um, we have about 5,000, about 4,000 students in our digital academy, and those are families that did not want, they do not want to come back this year, but they're students that are learning online and self-paced. Um, and our families want to know how do we check on our kids? You know, what are the flat uh, platforms? I'm using my phone um, to check my students' grades. I'm using my phone to try to pull up a, a, a YouTube video to learn something new. Um, so if we have things in place that's going to help our families, then we're on the right track. Um, and if we don't do it in isolation that, you know, it's a, okay, we're gonna do this one time and then we're, we're backing off, um, that is not the approach either. And I know that's not what my colleagues are saying. I think we, we are saying that moving forward, we've identified things that our students and our families need and we are going to take a, a, a almost, we're calling a whole child approach, but a whole community approach to this work to make sure that our families have what they need um, and these things for me apply to the k-12 space but they also apply to the workforce mm -hmm. um, and just communicating our SEL you know I don't like telehealth visits myself but I know that because of this pandemic we've had to look at a computer and talk to our doctors and it's very different but that's how we're going to move forward we should not think about going back we should look at here's an opportunity for us to be creative and help our students and our families and the people that live in this state leverage technology to be better at what we're doing now. And I think we're on to that and to be able to get funding for these initiatives um, and support from other stakeholders. Um, I'm just inspired because our students are going to benefit from yeah. our thinking are thinking ahead and planning ahead, our students are going to be in such a better place. We have uh, our audience, you all at home, uh, joining us and uh, sending some questions. I mean, you're probably at work as well uh, while you're eating lunch right now. I hope, <laughs> hope it's a good lunch because I'm kind of hungry. Um, and, and some folks are going to be chiming in. Jane, Jane you're standing by. Do you, you already have a question for us? Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Eric Brown from Columbus City Schools, uh, how will efforts to continue to bridge the digital divide be continued post-pandemic? How will these digital resources be used and remain essential post-pandemic? And I think you addressed that just a little bit, but maybe you expand? Yeah, so, so the resources that we receive, um, we are um, using our resources for curricular materials. Um, we were able to, thankful to the city, the city used part of their CARES dollars and were, gave us $7 million that we were able to uh, purchase technology for our, our students. But I do want to make sure that, um, that our listening audience understands that, you know, school districts can't do this work alone. Um, we are a part of this work and that we will sit and work with others, um, but this is a problem that's bigger than a K-12 space. And when we're talking about resources and this digital divide and, and all of that, that is something that we are a part of um, and that we will be at the table and we will be able to say, yes, we need these resources for our students and our families. And that learning doesn't stop when students leave the school grounds. Learning has to continue and our families have to have the resources and, and access to those resources in order to help our students. I will add to that, Jane, that the um, Franklin County Digital Equity Coalition is mm -hmm. focused on yeah. this being sustained work. Mm -hmm. um, so the coalition is really, as you mentioned earlier, um, really I have to give sincere gratitude both to the city and the mm -hmm. county for stepping up and using that CARES Act money. Um, Doug Kreiler and the Columbus Foundation also have supported this work um, with funding um, and Pat Lazinski and the 20 plus organizations, including the school district that are a part of the coalition are focused on affordable, effective options, yeah. devices, and digital life skills. This is a part of our community now. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, I had the privilege of being uh, able to write an article for Columbus CEO Magazine in October, mm -hmm. and I said, whose job is it anyway? Yeah. Um, and now it's our job. Yeah. It's the coalition's job. Mm -hmm. And at the community level, again, at the very local level, we're focused on this long term. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Brown, don't worry. We're yeah. on it. We're yeah. keeping our gas on our foot on the gas, and we're going to keep going. Yeah. All right. And, 
If I may, from the state's perspective, uh, obviously we stood up uh, Broadband Ohio. Uh, so this administration, this is not something that's gonna be an overnight project. It's, it's gonna take a long-term commitment. Uh, clearly, hopefully folks are seeing that. We are dedicated to this and want it to be successful long-term. Uh, Matteo Adair asks, why isn't municipal broadband being discussed? The internet is an essential public utility and should be managed as such. I don't, I think uh, some of our partners would agree with that. I think others wouldn't. Um, you know, I, because I can't see you, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go, I, I think from my perspective, certainly it's an essential service, but I think it's not regulated as a utility. That's not something I knew last year this time. Um, most of our federal, for example, funding towards infrastructure had gone to the internet service providers. And I think what we've learned now, um, and we love our internet service providers. So let me just say, there are many in the market that are providing great service, including to my home. Please don't look at my address and disrupt me, right? <laughs> but we have internet service providers in the urban core. They're not regulated. The funding is going towards their infrastructure, but that's not centering the households. And right. so we are now taking an opportunity to shift the discussion to focus on the people, yeah. getting them what they need, how they need it for what they want to use it for. Um, it could be regulated as a utility, but I think the benefit of it not is that it encourages competition. But the reality is that in some of our neighborhoods, which is why I think place-based is gonna be a model for us to replicate across our community and go from Franklin County to our contiguous counties and share our learnings across the state, we need to focus in place because there are some communities that have three and four providers available to them and some that only have one. Yeah. Um, and so we need to really get clear about what that means. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I don't have a dog in the fight if it's regulated as a utility or not, but I think this conversation encourages diversity of options and that's mm. what really matters. That's yeah. interesting you say that. I, I, please don't look up my address either and come find me. Uh, <laughs> but the, the building I live, I only have access to one service provider, mm -hmm. uh, begins with an A. And uh, I, I wanted the and ability to shop service, around. Yeah, but it's you great didn't service, get a but uh, the chance to shop around. Yeah, so. to shop yeah. around. Yeah. Okay. Trip Lazarus asks, what can I, as a concerned citizen without school-aged children uh, anymore, do to help? Mm. Well, I, I think right out of the gate, I would uh, remind them that there is currently legislation pending in the, uh, before the legislature. Uh, our uh, director actually testified on this yesterday, so we're getting closer. Uh, it was almost passed in the last General Assembly, mm -hmm. didn't quite get it there, but we're optimistic that that's gonna be passed very quickly. Uh, and that bill in particular uh, has about uh, $200 million uh, in it for broadband. Uh, so that, that would be one way to be active uh, right now. Great. Carol McGuire asks specifically, what boots on the ground organizations has the state reached out to so that the funding can be maximized? Well, here in Columbus, we are engaging with the Columbus Partnership. We actually provided uh, $100,000 in funding uh, to work with them. Uh, so they're standing up a program. I don't think anything's been announced yet in terms of who those, uh, they've been accepting bids, so there should be some good news coming very soon there. Uh, we're working with local entities around the state, a lot of activity uh, in the Cleveland area, and East Cleveland in particular. Uh, we're working with school districts around the state. We're working with various organizations. We're even working with our uh, internet service providers. Uh, as I said earlier, this really is, from our perspective, uh, we want it to be collaborative because uh, we don't have all the answers and we can't fix the problem on our own. I think this um, addresses a little bit more about that. Bill Lafayette from Regionomics, how do we balance the need for universal internet access against the fact that it, it's a big profit center for private mm -hmm. providers? What's their stance? Maybe the question is what's their motive to help fix this? Well, from the state perspective, I'll just say, you know, we're not picking the winners, we're not picking the technology. We wanna make sure the environment's there and our main concern is getting families uh, access to internet and affordable internet. It's our businesses, it's our communities. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do that. Uh, and so we wanna, we don't know, believe there's one size fits all or there's a single idea that, that outweighs the rest, but we wanna work with folks and we, we're certainly willing at our, at our agency to have a conversation with whomever. This question gets a little bit more at the legislation. Are there policies that need to be changed or created to enable better access? 
So the legislation um, doesn't really dive into a lot on the policy side. It, it's primarily a vehicle to one, uh, it'll set up uh, a, a broadband advisory board. That'll kind of be the entity that helps to distribute the grant funds that we will have. Uh, and it also makes a substantial amount, a, amount of money uh, available. Uh, I will tell you that in terms of a policy, one of the things that we are uh, setting as an expectation uh, is that the minimum would meet, uh, for any internet service provider, would have to be the federal minimum. But that is the bare minimum. And we are encouraging folks to exceed that and go higher. Great. Carol Luber asks, when students are behind for lack of devices or internet to get connected, how will they be helped to catch up? Uh, th thank you. So we have a help desk right now. So if families, if their computer is broken, they need a new one, all they have to do is set up an appointment and they would get a brand new device if they need a new hotspot. So we want to make sure that there are no barriers to families having access to the device or to um, internet. Um, if they, the student is still having some, some problems, um, we, we're encouraging families to um, immediately contact the school and have a meeting with their teachers or their guidance counselors um, to get whatever supports that they need. And then we have um, um, opportunities on um, Wednesdays that students can do just a one-on-one -on -one time with their uh, teachers if they need that they can um, we have that still have that advisory period uh, for our students and our families and then again we have already planned a robust summer program too so we're going to do a lot of um, work in the summer I want to just jump in one uh, to shout out to Carol Looper and I studied under Carol I had that question on here so I learned something uh, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dixon what about the uh, the differences in the needs when it comes to age groups you touched on that uh, a little earlier but it varies from a kindergartner we did a story yesterday um, where we looked at a middle school where sixth graders are going to their middle school for the first time yeah. the, the needs vary Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, our youngest uh, learners, um, one of the things that our first day back on February 1st, it was just our students were, you know, getting out of the cars and getting off the school bus with these masks. And the first thing they wanted to do was hug their teachers, right? So we couldn't hug, so they were doing these air hugs, you know. Um, and then our, but there was a, a, a another bright spot. Our principals and teachers said that our kindergarten students, there were no tears. Because usually first day of kindergarten, mm -hmm. the students didn't want to go in the classroom. They were hugging on to their moms and dads. But they had a chance to get to know their teachers on this platform. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they got to school, they rushed to the classrooms, right? Um, so we said, wait a minute, maybe we need to do this in the future. Mm -hmm. The first few weeks of kindergarten. Like an orientation type uh, thing. Orientation yeah. should be online. Um, and so we decided to do a phase-in approach. We wanted our sixth graders next week to be in the building by themselves. It's their first time, you know, and, and we're bringing our juniors and seniors back because our seniors are like, okay, we have most of our year has been in this online platform. We have some work to do. And we got our career center students back because think about our career students are utilizing high tech technology in a lot of their fields. So we needed our students to get back to their classrooms so that they had access to that technology in order to get those credentials that they need to graduate and be ready for the workforce um, and then our younger students really needed more social emotional care so we've had to make sure we build in lessons we have our social workers working with our students because this is so new to them they're used to playtime and touching and hugging and we have to make sure that our students understand this is very different but we still have programs um, and people to for them to talk to um, if they are not feeling okay. And to our adults, we've said over and over and over again, it's okay to say that you're not okay. And we have those services for our adults too. So everyone in this K-12 space, this is different for everyone. And we wanted to make sure that we had a platform to engage our learners as well as our adults and our administrators so that we can get through this and get back to um, a sense of some sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. So um, Mars Booker, has there been any outreach to universities about having STEM students help with teaching digital li literacy? That's I can, a, I can go, give go, a couple examples. Yeah. So one of the things that we're leveraging um, 
in the PAC neighborhood is a partnership at Ohio State called Digital Flagship. So we do have students, they're not necessarily STEM students, but they're what we call digital natives. They know um, technology, and I think it connects a little to Carrie's previous question that age demographics in K-12 is one thing, but age demographics of a community are also important. And so we're also specifically focusing on our older adults. And I believe, and you know, I have the privilege of having what I call my old lady gang um, <laughs> on the Near East side who will tell me, Autumn, that's not working, or you need to think about that. But I believe that if we create digital tools, leveraging those digital natives, college students, who by the way, also have a crisis around digital divide too. But um, if we leverage those digital natives and create learning opportunities for older adults, those same tools can be used for other members of our population who also need um, a lift with digital skills. And I must say, I've been talking about this for the last year. I don't go a place without somebody raising their hand to help. Yeah. So it's not just higher ed, but our business community yeah. is stepping up. Our banks are helping us develop um, tools around safety online and, yeah. and privacy online. Um, there are corporations that have internally facing um, upskilling programs that are interested in offering those to the community as well. So to Dr. Dixon's point, mm -hmm. it takes all of us and I think Columbus, unlike many cities that I've talked to across the community, we're well positioned. So mm -hmm. when Carrie said earlier, we can do this, yeah. we can do this and yeah. shame on us if we don't because yeah. we have everything that we need. Exactly. Um, and it's really about that coordinated effort. So. Yeah. so Autumn, are there other organizations like PAC in other neighborhoods in Columbus? Absolutely. Um, so there are organizations on the south side, the west side, in Linden, um, and that's the other thing too about Columbus. We're uniquely positioned. Every urban community in Columbus has faced some level of revitalization in the last 15 or 20 years, and we all know each other. So we're sharing our notes. Um, we have spent a lot of time as a coalition also talking with folks in Cleveland. Um, they're a little ahead of us. The Cleveland Foundation and the Columbus Foundation work um, very collaboratively together, and so we've benefited from learnings both locally and we're sharing. So um, he mentioned the pilots that uh, the city and Smart Columbus are doing. The PAC neighborhood will be one of those, and the South Side will be as well, and we're leveraging those community-based organizations. I think we could take one more live question. Mm -hmm. So a year ago, we were having very different conversations. A year from now, what will the conversation be like, and what will you be talking about as far as what you've accomplished? Wow, great question. Who asked that question? Yeah. That was my last question. Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, for us, and I think the last time I made, when I was here, I was talking about this whole, this um, portrait of a graduate, right? So mm -hmm. we as a community came together with, with a, um, a conversation facilitated by Patel for Kids. And it was, what are our hopes and dreams and aspirations for Columbus City Schools? And from that, we came with six attributes. And we said we want our students to be creative thinkers, adaptability, um, um, empathy, um, global empathy. Um, those are the things we want for our students. And our students are leading the way. That is our new vision. So from that, we're gonna see our students take have co-designing their educational experience so when we come back in a year we're going to be able to have our students lead in the conversations and our students sitting here telling the community what their learning experience has been from this point to next point and uh, for next year and talking about what they've learned um, and what they're doing how they are being agents for change um, and we're going to be excited about that. So our students are going to be your next guests and talking about their experience and how their parents, the new learning from their parents and their community. So I'm just uh, excited about that next platform that you guys are going. And maybe Carrie, you can facilitate that conversation um, with our you're students have you back for a third time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's what you're going to hear next year this time. I'm gonna, oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, first off, I hope we have a room full of people a year yes. from now, yes. um, but also I hope that we have a lot of successes to point to when yeah. we're back that show not just the investments that are being made, the strategic investments to address that availability and that affordability, and also a lot of uh, strong partnerships to point to that connect all levels uh, to achieve the goals that we, we've been talking about today. I, everything that they said, I think we will be testing some of those successes in other neighborhoods and replicating this good work over and over. And I think the other thing that I look forward to is that we really have recognition that 
if we are able, when we are able to be successful in getting people online in ways that are meaningful to them, that our community will be better for it. And there's an economic case to be made, and I think that's the next um, topic. I think we have somebody on the CMC board who can cover that, but um, to really think about how we leverage the talent that's going untapped because yeah. people aren't able to be connected. We are, um, in case you didn't see, I got a time cue over here. <laughs> uh, but I am gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask each of you to just fill in the blank. My greatest concern when it comes to the digital divide is? Equity. Equity? Access. Access? Yeah, after that, equity. Equity, yeah. okay. I was going to ask you to expand, but uh, time is up. <laughs> Very good conversation. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. Very Thank good. you. And Doug, I'm going to slide to the left. So you can All right. slide Thank it. you very much, Gary. Sure thing. Well, I hope you found today's forum enlightening. I know I did. Um, our next forum, we will explore the critical issue of internet access. No, we already did that one. Uh, let's, uh, let's thank today's uh, sponsor, Starry, and uh, thanks also to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for, for presenting our live streaming in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch, PNC, and NBC4i. Thanks again to our virtual online seat patrons and a special appreciation to our speakers. We couldn't have done this without you, Autumn Glover, Dr. Talisa Dixon, Matt McClellan, and Carrie Charles. We hope you again. Uh, we hope that you tune again in again next week. Until then, be well and be safe. Thank you.